Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking all about how to care for the oh so beautiful Apobolus acuminatissima lava lake plant. Now this is what is commonly referred to as a purple sword plant, not to be confused though with the alocasia purple sword. I have heard some people starting to refer to this as a red sword plant, perhaps to help differentiate between the purple sword alocasia and this when saying it's a purple sword plant. But the main reason for that common name or both of those common names is that this is a plant with very lance shaped leaves. And then the back sides of these leaves are this beautiful reddish purplish color. Now I want to start out talking first a little bit about the growth pattern of this plant and kind of some other plants that it's very closely related to because the care for this plant is similar to the other plants that I'm going to mention that it is related to with some key differences, key differences really being that, first of all, I find this plant to be much more beautiful than some of those plants. And I find that in certain ways it is a little bit less fussy and I will explain what I mean as we go along. So the two primary plants that this is closest related to are actually the Aglionemas and the Schismatoglottis plants. Now you will probably sometimes find this incorrectly labeled as either a Schismatoglottis or an Aglionema in stores as well but just know that scientifically it is technically an apobolus plant. But it does look a very similar, especially to my schismatoglottis plant because it has this beautiful kind of grayish, speckly-ish variegation on the leaf. It's the same shape leaf as on my schismatoglottis, but of course we've got the beautiful red backs to these leaves that are not on my schismatoglottis and not on any of my aglionema. Now, as far as the growth pattern goes for this plant, I'm gonna be straight up honest with you guys. In researching this, I was reading all over the place that this is a rhizome-based plant. I don't know that that is actually accurate or not. I'm just bringing it up in case it turns out I'm wrong. But if we look at this, the schismatoglottis plants, first of all, are rhizome-based. Aglionema are not. Aglionema are a... Technically, you still would refer to them as a clumping plant, but they basically just form new shoots off of the primary shoot. So if you can see here, like I managed not to hit the mic, we have all these different stalks. This looks very similar to what you would see on an aglionema. So one of these was the primary point from which the plant first grew. And then at the very base, so let's just assume it was this one, even though it's probably not, it's probably the one that's in the middle of this cluster. But if it was this one, everything that grows off of here would be coming out from the base of this plant. And then another one would come out here, back here, so on and so forth, but they're all connected to the same point under that soil. That is not rhizome-based growth. Rhizome-based growth is what we see on the schismatoglottis, where we have a rhizome that is swirling around underneath the soil, and from different points on that rhizome, new offshoots come up out of the soil. If you hear noise, we have a cat playing in the cover pot for this plant right now. Can you get out of there, please? Okay. Yes, you're super cute. Let me put this back in there. Actually not, because I need to show the people something, Scooter. Be good. The other thing is, if you look down in the soil here, considering how long I've had this plant at this point, you would see the rhizome starting to spread around the edge here. We can barely see the roots spreading around the edge, and that is another thing that I want to point out. This plant grows more at a rate of an aglionema than it does of a schismatoglottis plant. Because schismatoglottis is rhizome-based, it grows crazy fast, way faster than aglionemas. This grows at pretty much the same rate as my aglionemas. It doesn't root and get root bound nearly as quickly as the schismatoglottis. It basically behaves almost identically in that sense to my aglionemas. Excuse you, sir. Let me put this back in his cover pot so he can't be playing around in the cover pot. Okay, so I think we're good to go. So like I was saying, from the standpoint of how this grows at the base, Definitely more like an aglionema and definitely does not look like a rhizome situation to me. Once again, I could be wrong. I just don't really want to pull all of the dirt off of here to try to figure it out for sure, which is what I would have to do. But just based on what I'm seeing here, I do not think this is actually a rhizome based plant. Now, as far as how the leaves come in, it is very similar to on a schismatoglottis though, more so than on an aglionema. And I've said before that schismatoglottis come in looking very similar to how alocasia do, where like, for example, this leaf right here just came out of this leaf, and this leaf came out of this leaf, and so on and so forth. That is how the leaves come in on here. So in that regard, very similar to the schismatoglottis plant. Now, I will say that in general, this looks much more like my schismatoglottis plant than even my aglionema maria, which is a lance-shaped leafed aglionema with similar variegation. 
but this looks way more similar to my schismatoglottis, but I want you guys to know up front, the number one complaint I have about my schismatoglottis plant is it perhaps guttates more than even any of my alocasias do. And as most of us know, alocasias are notorious for guttating. If you don't know what guttating is, that is when you wake up in the morning and there is just water dripping off of the tips of your leaves. The leaves are a little bit wet and soggy on the tips. Happens mostly with alocasia, but I have had a bigger problem with it on my schizomatoglottis plant than any other plant I have ever owned. I am happy to report I do not have that problem on this plant. As you can see, none of those tips look damaged, wet, like they've been mushy, anything like that. They will get, as the leaf gets older and starts to die off, you will start to get a little bit of that going on, but that's just because these are the oldest leaves and they're kind of getting ready to die off, but they aren't actually guttating. I'm not waking up in the morning and finding water spots all over the counter where this plant lives, unlike with my schismatoglottis, where the floor is just covered in wet drops every single morning. So definitely a plus to this plant. All right, so this plant is native to Indonesia. So it is used to a very kind of wet, humid environment. However, I have found that this plant really does well in my home just in normal conditions. So let's go ahead and get into the type of conditions that this plant wants. And I think we'll start with lighting. So this plant is not gonna want super bright direct light that can damage the leaves, can cause some scorching, you can get some paling of the leaves, things like that. Those will be good indicators that you have it in too much light. It really wants bright indirect light. So mine, ever since I have had it, has been living in a west facing window. That particular west facing window is in my kitchen and I do have, my neighbors are in a two story house that is right outside that window. So that is slightly obstructing that window. This time of year, sometimes I get worried that my plants in that window aren't getting enough light because we have less daylight hours. So the amount of time that the light's kind of coming in directly at the end of the afternoon is very brief compared to in the summertime. So sometimes I find I have to move some plants to brighter locations during this time of year. But this plant I have never had to move and it has done fine. It does fine in the summer as well when it's getting that light for a little bit of a longer period of time. And it is pretty far back, I say pretty far back, it's not really that far back. It's kind of back about a foot and a half maybe and then slightly off to the side of the window, like right off to the side of the window. But the way the sun comes in angles towards it. So it does get some direct light but it's far enough away from where the direct light's coming in that I haven't seen any negative effects. So as always, just move your plants into brighter locations. If you do see any negative effects happening, like I described, scorching the leaves, paling of the leaves, things like that, move them further back, find that happy spot, or you may just need to move them to a different window altogether. I am pretty certain that this plant would do well in a unobstructed north facing window if you just put it directly in the window because it is so similar to, you know what, I'm gonna take that back. It is very similar to schismatoclotus and aglianema. I would have to try it out. You could try it in a north facing window, just, just pay real close attention to it because my schismatoglottis lives in a north facing window and it has done fine there. When I had my aglianema maria in a north facing window, it survived, but it was not doing its best. It was not looking its best. And it is now living in a indirect lighting situation off to the side of a west facing door and south facing windows where it gets no direct light and it has been doing so much better. So because this is kind of almost like, I guess I should just say it's, it looks and acts a little bit like a cross between an aglianema and a schismatoglottis. I can't say for certain since I haven't tried it, how well it would do in a north facing window. If anybody does have one and has it in north facing window and it's done great for them, please comment down below so other people will know. But really bright indirect light is what you're gonna want for this plant. Now, Let's talk about watering. So like I said, this plant is native to Indonesia. It is used to kind of a rainy environment. And because of that, I highly recommend not letting this plant dry all the way out. In fact, quite frequently, you will probably find yourself looking at the top of the soil thinking, okay, the very top of it looks a little bit dry, but it still feels pretty damp right beneath that. And then the next day you'll wake up, you'll walk into the room where you have this plant. And instead of looking nice and perky like it does right now, the whole plant will be drooped down like this and the leaves will be completely limp and unfirm. And you'll be like, what the heck? It still feels quite damp in there. This is a plant that prefers to be kept on the moist side and it is very vocal if you do not water it on time it will definitely limp. So just be aware that you are going to think the soil is still damp. 
with this plant and you are going to need to water it when it is still damp. Me risk taking it out of its cover pot again. And maybe we can see, because this plant is gonna need to be watered probably tomorrow. I don't know how well you guys are gonna be able to tell on screen here, come on camera. It's probably too much of a glare, but it still is pretty damp in there. It's a little bit dry, not even like really totally dry on top of you guys. I mean, it's just, it's damp. Like the soil is not like ex excessively dry or anything like that. But if I don't water this tomorrow, I will wake up the next day and it will be super duper droopy. Now the good news is it does bounce back. If you do have it get to that point, the second you water it, it'll start to perk back up and everything should be a-okay. You may lose some of the oldest leaves in that process though, so try not to be always letting it get to that droopy stage before it needs to be watered. Now, because it does like to be kept more on the moist side, soil is very, very key with this plant. I do use my forest floor mix for this plant. If you're not familiar with my soil mixes and what plants I use which mix for, I do have a brief video on that that I will link below in the description for you. But basically this forest floor mix is designed to simulate the natural environment that this plant grows in, in Indonesia. So it's a mix of soil that is designed to retain some moisture since this plant does not like to dry all the way out, but it's also still well draining and well aerated so that the roots aren't getting like suffocated and we're not risking a root rot situation. I will say I find on Schismatoglottis, Aquianema, and the Apobolus plants, that root rot is not that common as long as you have an appropriate soil type and as long as you're giving it enough light to use up its water in a timely manner. This plant gets watered probably, I think it's once once a week basically. I think it's we're averaging probably once every six days. If it's been like rainy a couple days a week or something, we might go to seven or eight before I have to water it. But if it's like sunny all week, it's probably six days before I have to water this plant. Again, it is just in a six inch pot. And like I said, it is in a west facing window. If this plant was taking like two weeks to dry out, I would probably think we have a problem probably with the lighting. We'll probably need a little bit more light. You just kind of have to judge it, you guys, like based on the size of the plant, because if this was twice as in a pot twice as big as this, yes, if it took two weeks to dry out, that wouldn't necessarily be like abnormal or something to be concerned about because it's a much bigger pot of soil and a much bigger plant. But for a plant this size, if it was taking me like two weeks, I would probably want to move it to a brighter location. But definitely highly recommend this type of soil for this plant. Now, as far as temperature and humidity goes, so like I said, native to Indonesia, what we know is probably quite warm and also quite humid where they grow naturally out in the wild. The good news is I have found that this plant does absolutely fine with normal conditions in my household. Ideal temperature range for this plant is gonna be between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Really the only time you're gonna risk some damage on this is if your temperature in your house starts to get more towards the 50 something range. Definitely anything below 50 is gonna be a problem for this plant. So if it is cold in the winter and like you lose heat or something like that, that would be a problem. The only other time temperature could potentially be an issue is if you do have this plant placed too close to a window that gets super cold in the winter or that gets super hot in the summer. Be mindful of that because that can cause cold or heat damage to the plant. And then also always just avoid having the plant in a direct draft from an AC vent or a heat vent or sitting on top of a radiator or anything that is gonna change that temperature unfavorably around that plant. Now, humidity in my household, this time of year is crap. It is crap, you guys. It's been worse this year, I feel like, than past years. We were one week, a few weeks ago, I don't think we got above like 28% humidity in here, but obviously we are looking fine. We did not need a humidifier. You guys, I have not run a humidifier in my house in probably almost two years now. Like I just gave up, like they're just such a hassle and my plants are doing fine. I don't do anything special. They aren't on pebble trays. They just live where they live and nobody really has a, that big of a problem with it. I do see some kind of weird changes sometimes when we do have really cold weeks and I have like I said, 28% humidity. There might be a little bit of funkiness with some of the leaves for a bit, but it, the plants always bounce back. And this one doesn't get, didn't get funky like at all. It is really done fine with it. Now, ideally, of course, it would probably prefer higher humidity. It might grow a little bit more quickly if it had higher humidity, but it has done fine in my household, in my humidity ranges. In the summer, I do get more in the like 50, 60% range. 
and it does grow a little bit more quickly in the summer for me, but not actually like a crazy fast grower. This plant faster than an aglaonema in my experience, but not as fast as the schismatoglottis. All right, so as far as fertilization goes for this plant, I just use my regular balance 10, 10, 10, as far as the NPK 10, 10, 10 liquid fertilizer. I do once a month in the winter, in the summertime, because this is a plant that I water once a week, I will up that to once every two weeks. So basically every other watering, I will give it fertilizer since it does tend to grow more in the summer. Now let's talk about pests. Oh, pests. <laughs> I was gonna say, luckily I don't, I haven't had a pest problem on this plant. I think I haven't had a pest problem on this plant. I did have a cutting of a philodendron red Anderson and a Syngonium mojito and a glass of water propagating on the kitchen ledge above the kitchen sink next to where this plant was. And they ended up with spider mites somehow. I don't know you guys, I've never had like, and they didn't get cut off a plant that was in soil that had spider mites or anything like that. They were just imported and the roots were kind of bad. So I put them in water to start new roots. And out of nowhere, I went and looked and they had spider mites on them. And I got paranoid that everybody around them had spider mites. And I thought maybe this plant did, but I don't think so because I haven't seen anything since then. And it's been like a month and a half since then. So if it's pest prone, I was going to say spider mites would be the number one pest that would be attracted to this because it is a very thin leafed plant. But for whatever reason, those spider mites, I mean, I'm pretty sure one of these leaves was touching that red Anderson, you guys, and they didn't decide to come mess with this plant. So that's a good sign that maybe pests aren't that interested in it. But I still think spider mites would probably be your number one pest problem that you might see on this plant. Obviously, thrips can be an issue. I don't really necessarily foresee you getting a bunch of mealybugs on here, but I mean, mealy mealybugs will eat just about anything. So if there's nothing else around, yes, mealybugs could be a problem on that, on this plant. But I really feel like spider mites would be the number one pest that would be attracted to this plant. But as always, you guys, pest prevention, it's really about the prevention part. Taking steps to mitigate having pest issues because lots of times, especially with spider mites, you don't even know the pests are there until it's like a bad infestation because they're so small, like you can't see them. It's not until you start to see the webbing that you know there's a problem and then it's really like too far gone, right? So I do have several videos as well on pest prevention. I have a specific video just on spider mites because if you're new here, I hate spider mites. And that is the pest I've had the biggest problem with in my plant journey. I will link those videos below in the description for you as well so that you can quickly locate them. Okay, repotting. Once again, this plant grows very similarly to my aglionema. I have had to repot my aglionema once and she has barely started to spread new roots around since I did it and it has been well over a year. So I doubt that you would have to repot this plant very frequently at all. I would still check it once a year just to see because everybody's environment and their homes and the conditions that you're growing the plant in are gonna be slightly different. So for you, it might grow just a little bit faster than me and the roots will spread more. But I'm thinking you're probably gonna be looking at like once every two years or so to repot this plant. Just wait until it's pretty root bound before you do because you don't wanna be repotting it before that, because then you might just have too much soil to root ratio. That's gonna make the plant stay wet longer. And then potentially you could have a root rot situation. Now, as far as propagating these plants go, because it is that clumping style plant and it's all, I think, growing off of one central stem, basically this plant needs to be propagated via division. So usually I would recommend because it needs to be propagated via division, only doing it at the time that you're repotting because you're having to mess with it anyway. If you did want to propagate it prior to that, what you're gonna have to do, you guys, is basically dig down in here to get to where this connects to where whichever of the main central plants it is. Dig down in there and find that spot and try to cut with some of the roots attached. So you wanna cut that off of the main connection point but you wanna make sure that the roots that are actually growing off of there, you get a few of those as well. You can potentially take a whole stalk. I've seen people try to do it. It's tricky, you guys, with these plants. So you can potentially like take a whole stalk. You definitely, if you do this, once you cut that stalk off, you're gonna to need to let it lay out for a bit till the end where you cut calluses over and becomes a 
hard so that you're not risking a rot situation, you can take that and stick it into water and try to develop roots that way. It's just a bigger risk. Sometimes it just doesn't want to do it. And sometimes it just starts to rot before it does it. I did actually, let me go grab something to show you guys real quick because I haven't given you a follow up on it. And it kind of would help illustrate what I'm talking about. One second. Okay, so when we were dividing recently, I say recently, it's probably been a few months now since we did it, but we did divide my schismatoglottis plant. And when we did that, I accidentally broke off part of one of the plantlets and it did have a tiny little bit of rhizome growing just like at a little point off of where I snapped it off. I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see, but there's this little green point right there. That is the little bit of rhizome that was on here. And because it had a little bit of rhizome, I had told you guys, I think we would be able to stick it into water and get roots because we had that little bit of rhizome. Now, if it had snapped up here and I put the leaves just from here, like without this part on the bottom into water, it would not have worked. But as you can see here, we do have roots now. Now it's taken quite a bit of time for that to start because I didn't have a lot of rhizome. So if I had had more of the rhizome on this, it would have rooted much more quickly, but it did work. So if you want to try that, just know you're running a bigger risk of this plant, of it not working, doing it that way versus digging down, like I said, and making sure you have roots actually attached to it. But if you do do that, you need to get as far down on the base of this stem here as you can. Make sure you remove any of this old dried leaf petiole stuff off of there because putting that in the water, you're just increasing the chances of rot and things happening and making the water just funky. But if you do that, it should work as long as you've got enough of that base. But once again, make sure you leave it out and let the very end of it where you made the cut dry up and callus over first. That is also what I did with this one, even though technically I broke it off, I didn't cut it off. That would be your best bet if you wanna try it that way. But really, if you just, unless you just absolutely are dying to propagate it, or if something's going wrong with the plant and you're trying to save it, but in that situation, you probably would be repotting it anyway. Unless you're like having to like do it for some whatever reason, I would just wait till you need to repot it because then you can really dig down in the soil and it's not gonna be that big of a deal because you're gonna have to disturb the plant anyway to repot it. Now, when you do repot it, just a reminder, just go up one pot size. And by one pot size, I mean two inches. So for example, this is in a six inch pot over here. So next time I would repot it, I would just take it up to an eight inch pot. Definitely don't wanna go too big because once again, it doesn't seem to root quite as quickly as some of my other plants and we don't want it being in excessive soil and then staying wet too long and potentially causing root rot. All right, guys, the last thing we have to talk about as usual is toxicity. And unfortunately this plant, just like Aglianema and Schismatoglottis is toxic to pets. So you really wanna to try to keep it out of their reach. I do find plants like that and the Schismatoglottis that have leaves that kind of are lance shaped and flop over like this are more tempting to pets as well. So even if your pets don't go for some of your other plants, they might be more tempted to go for this Apobolus plant. And just know too that a few nipples is not going to kill your pet, don't panic. Typically these plants that we say are toxic have certain things in them that when the pets bite into them, it should irritate their mouth to the point that they won't want to keep eating it but sometimes some of them are just stubborn and keep eating it. If they do swallow a little bit of it and everything though, usually they'll end up just throwing that part of the leaf back up and they'll be fine. You just don't want them like consuming the entire plant or doing this continually over a long period of time because then that can cause a problem. So always just play it safe if they are just repeatedly going and chewing on the ends of those leaves and you can't get them to stop, move the plant somewhere else out of their reach. But I hope you guys have found this video helpful today. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below. And I look forward to seeing you again next time. Aloha.